Uh, I'm Andreas, I'm one of the core committees. Uh, so, hello, hello. I'm here to talk to you about what possibly is uh, the greatest innovation in our lifetime, uh, which is namely the web. And I think that everyone in this room cares quite deeply uh, for the web. In fact, I think that the people in this room cares more deeply for the web than many other groups. So, I want to give, start off by giving a little insight into uh, the life which you have now introduced yourself, uh, which is the life of the web developer. Uh, so, of course, what web developers do is that they invent and they create the web, right? Uh, this guy uh, is a web developer, apparently. Uh, really a modest bunch. Uh, we don't care much for titles, apparently. Uh, but unlike, m unlike many other inventions, uh, the web is not a static thing. Uh, the web is almost 20 years old, a little over 20 years actually. The modern web is about 16. And uh, we're not using the web as it was invented. The web as it was invented was a fairly basic uh, thing. Now the web is, is a living thing. It's something that evolves every single day. And it evolves in many different ways. Uh, it evolves because there is no single eventer, for example. Uh, Tim, uh, the director, he could have said, he could have kept the web for himself, but he decided not to. He decided to open it up. Uh, he happened to get the idea of this electronic system of interlink interlinked hypertext documents, but uh, he chose not to restrict its use in any way. Uh, he said that it was not his to safeguard. Ex in fact, he did the exact opposite thing. He decided to open the web up for everyone. And uh, the web consequently evolves through individuals like you and me. So we have services like RSS, syndication, we have hosted web apps, all, of, all new innovations, big uh, websites which we go to every day. And there are some things which we, we, uh, we invent which are uh, so important to the structure and the architecture of the web that it eventually gets put into a web browser. And you, you guys all know this because you're all web developers, but precisely because of this fantastic, fantastic plethora of innovations and ideas, uh, it's sometimes a little bit difficult to agree on uh, exactly what is a good idea for, for, for our community at, at, at large and what, which ideas are destructive. Now, as a web developer, uh, we have a responsibility f to, to test, um, a responsibility to improve the web. One way to improve the web is, uh, amongst other things, through standards. Now, my argument is that testing is quite a fundamental concept to, to software engineering in general. If you write a software program uh, today, it's inconceivable not to test it. And the uh, ironic thing, is that that's not the case, or at least not until recently, has not been the case with web standards, with specifications. Sp uh, specifications are sufficiently complex that uh, you can't just define them and rely on the browser vendors to implement them. Uh, they are subject uh, to a much, they need a much more thorough testing effort uh, to, uh, to actually make sure that they, uh, they are as good as they can get. Now, browser vendors, they do test their software, they do test their browsers, but they don't run the same test cases, for example, and they don't test uh, in the same way. And uh, everyone who's worked a little bit with like, CI environments, we know that um, uh, the environment in which you test has a tremendous effect on, on the outcome of the tests. Now, we have to ask ourselves, is this behavior from the browser vendors good for the web? Well, I mean, no, it's obviously not good. Uh, it means probably less work for the browser vendors. It means that they don't, test, uh, don't, they don't have to test as much. They don't have to write the tests. But for us as users, it, we, we suffer at the lack of interoperability. Uh, I'm, I'm quite sure that most people in this room have has discovered some feature in some browser which doesn't work in another browser. And that's one example of, in, uh, of lacking interoperability. Um, now, I'm here to talk about the web platform and how, it, and how we test it. Um, but 
the web platform. What exactly is the web, pla web platform? Uh, it's, it's a fairly uh, browser-specific implementation detail. So in short, I'm going to, uh, to, to, um, to go through it. Um, in short, all cross-browsing technologies that uh, browsers like Firefox, IE, and Chrome build and ship, it's a collection of web technology standards developed by the WOTPG, uh, W3C, the IETF, ECMA International, and Unicode Consortium. It is basically a big collection of technologies, and to, to illustrate that, I'm going to go through just some of them. And um, I don't think most people who develop for the web realize that this is actually the world's most advanced um, uh, application platform. And it works, I mean, even if you give it invalid code, or if you give, uh, or if the browsers aren't fully compatible, or if something doesn't exactly work, it all works itself out. And this is because of uh, the way that uh, the evolution of the web. It, it, I mean, it didn't have to be, be like that. It could be that we would have more strict standards, which would uh, uh, limit uh, which websites would work in different browsers. Uh, so, um, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. There are not many technologies that can boast the same level of backwards compatibility. For example, a website which was made in 1995 still works in a browser today, and that's pretty fantastic. But it's important for us as uh, web developers to make sure that we don't regress the web, that we don't deprecate how the web works, and that we don't make any content on the web inaccessible. And that's one reason why we have these standards. Now, uh, there are some core technologies, HTML, DOM, ECMAScript, ECMAScript, which is actually JavaScript, URL, XHR, uh, cores, CSS encoding, but the list goes on. There are so many things to test. And each one of these uh, words, or uh, each one of these has its own uh, specification. And these are all technologies implemented in browsers. So you have Animations, font positioning, WebGL, all of these things are, are foundational web uh, platform technologies. Media, events and messaging, um, cross-document messaging, very exciting new technology. Um, there are APIs for if, you, if you're using a, uh, a device like this one for getting uh, uh, the battery level, uh, uh, the device orientation, whether it's upright or sideways, um, vibration, uh, etc. And the list just goes on. Uh, and many of these things have been, have been actually invented and specced in the more recent years. And uh, interestingly, uh, in the category other, uh, as categorized by, uh, by the W3C, uh, there's also a new uh, specification, uh, which I've highlighted there, called WebDriver. So uh, exciting times. So uh, documentation on this is uh, found on these various uh, URLs. If you just search for a doc uh, if you search for a specification, be a little bit cautious of what you uh, what you find, uh, because most of it is just outdated, and you need to go to the to the real sources. And uh, um, uh, developer.mozilla.org is a, is an excellent reference. Now uh, the web used to be a very simple place. We used to have useless standards. Uh, that no one followed. Uh, we used to have browsers who did pretty much what they wanted. Um, I'm not sure if anyone remembered, remembers the blink tag and the marquee tag, but that's like one example of uh, the browser wars which happened uh, about 10 years ago between Netscape and Microsoft. Um, around the same time, uh, the W3C, uh, the World Wide Web Consortium, uh, realized that this was getting out of hand and they needed to do something. So they started uh, the process of specking XHTML, which, which was going to save the web uh, from, this, from this mess that it was in. Uh, and that's true. I mean, the web was in a big mess. Uh, but at this point, uh, it, was also, um, um, it was also in a position where the browser vendors were saying, well, we have all of these users and we have all of this, this web content. We can't just deprecate it and, and, and don't allow people access to it. Pages must work. That's a, like a secret mantra of the browser developer. Now, eventually, someone, uh, the browser vendors in this case, realized that a spec describing reality was a much better approach. And so HTML5 was born. So the web used to be simple. 
Uh, but World Wide Web has morphed from a system of simple interlinked documents into something which is uh, so advanced that, uh, new, um, that new approaches to testing is necessary. Uh, we used to test for regressions, uh, and, but, we also have, uh, but now we also have specs which comes with tests, so we need, a, we need to find a, a way uh, to test those. So the question is if we can do better than we did uh, a year ago, two years ago, five years ago. And the answer is, of course, that we can do better. We can do better with automated testing. And uh, I think uh, Anand Bagba made some very eloquent, uh, uh, had a very eloquent talk yesterday about the need for automated testing and what it means. So I urge you to look up the video from that if you didn't attend. We need tests which are vendor neutral so that we can share the tests between different browsers. We need them to be run in continuous integration environments so that we can get immediate feedback. Uh, otherwise, it's really hard to find, uh, to find proper regressions. And it would be really nice if the tests were accessible to everyone, right? Uh, and a way, uh, I mean, ha having access to the tests which the browser vendors use to make their browsers with means that we have a way of keeping tabs on our browsers uh, to make sure that they are actually doing uh, what's in the best interest for the web. And um, consequently, for the browser vendors, it also means that they get better interoperability. Now, there is a, the, um, uh, there is a, uh, a project uh, for this, uh, which is called uh, Test the Web Forward. And uh, it's an open source project, and uh, you'll find the link here. Uh, I really urge you to go and uh, check out this project. Uh, it's a project by individuals uh, who submit tests back to a, a, a repo called the Web Platform Tests repo. And it's uh, situated on GitHub, so it's really easy to, to write tests. So the Web Platform Tests repo is, uh, well, basically tests for the open web platform. They're collated by the W3C, but uh, the W3C doesn't write any tests themselves because they rely on contributions from individuals and from browser vendors. Uh, they are continually upgraded, which, uh, updated, sorry, which means that uh, which just underbuilds my point, underpins my point about the web being a living thing. It's not a static thing which you spec and then implement. Uh, the specs evolve um, at, at the same time as, as, as you implement them. Uh, I'll upload the, the slides so you can uh, get the links. Now, um, exactly what do we test in a, um, in a specification? Well, we look for conformance requirements is one thing. And uh, they're based on an RFC, uh, which is 2119, uh, which is known to everyone who works in the browser business, which basically is like uh, you have statements going must, must not, should, uh, should not, may, etc. And uh, these tell the browser vendors what they must implement, what they can choose not to implement, and what they are optional, uh, what, what, what they can optionally uh, implement. Uh, there are also some statements uh, which are unambiguously requirements. Uh, there are some statements which are candidate uh, requirements, um, uh, which basically says that, uh, which is basically statements which go, you can choose not to test this. Um, uh, for, num for number four, uh, we have uh, requirements which often uh, which often have stated, uh, which are often stated with algorithms. Uh, the web driver spec has some awful al algorithms, for example. Uh, they're really, really complex, but it, but it gives uh, the testers a really good idea of what you need to, what you need to test. Uh, there's a single requirement. Uh, a single requirement usually requires multiple tests. A single test case, maybe a, comp maybe a, a test may require um, a combination of, 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 uh, of multiple tests. A single test case may test a combination of requirements, but in short, the whole thing is very complicated. But more importantly, specs lie. Um, specs have bugs, just like software. Uh, reality changes constantly. Uh, sometimes the specs themselves don't match reality, and this is precisely why the web is so bonkers. Um, Pre-HTML5, specs were written uh, first and then attempted implemented. The reality was that no one implemented these specs. Uh, for example, HTML4 uh, was not implemented because it was unimplementable. And it was also wrong, but that's, that's another discussion. Um, HTML5 isn't making the same mistake uh, because it specifies what browsers are actually doing. 
Uh, it started out with just specifying what they were doing, and now it's like continuing to add new things. But w the, uh, I mentioned that the web is a, is a massive place, which basically means that deprecation is very hard. So the first time, you, well, when you introduce a new feature, you can't just remove it. Uh, if, a future, if, if a feature is used by only 1% of users, that's several uh, tens of millions of, of, of users. So uh, it, it's really hard to be, uh, uh, to be uh, specking uh, something like uh, the web. In uh, the web platforms uh, test repo, there are several different test types. There's a script test type, uh, which is driven by a framework uh, called, uh, um, called testharness.js which is written by a colleague of mine, uh, James Graham, at Mozilla. Uh, there are web IDL tests. Uh, web IDL is basically, well, I'll return to that later and I can show you an example. Uh, ref tests, uh, we, have ref, we have ref tests, there are manual tests. And finally, a uh, recent addition, a new test type to the W3C is, are the web driver implementation tests, which I just landed a uh, patch for a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we can start with the script tests. They are basically JavaScript. Uh, they run in context, um, in context of of the um, of the browser window in the in the top level browsing context. And this is an example of what the test looks like. So you have a basic HTML page. You load in the test harness. Uh, you have a test function. Uh, it takes the document title, uh, which is meant to be document title, and it asserts that those things match. It's an example of a very very simple. A test, but this is an actual test which is located in the, in the WPT repo. And the reason we have these tests is, of course, that if someone happens to break uh, the title tag, uh, that uh, we, we catch the regression before it uh, ships. Uh, this is an example of this test running in the harness. Uh, you, just, um, you just spin up a web server to serve you the, the, the harness, test harness.js script, and uh, you uh, go to the URL. Simple as that. Uh, there are a number of different test harness JS uh, assertions. Uh, you have all of the usual uh, suspects here. Um, uh, there are a few special ones, uh, which are like uh, assert own property, because uh, uh, objects in JavaScript can have properties. Uh, there's prototype, prototypal um, checks and a, and a few other, uh, few other things. Um, because uh, because um, uh, JavaScript is inherently asynchronous, there is also a need to test uh, callbacks and event handlers. And um, uh, I'll show you an example of an async test. So basically, you have to uh, register a handler. And for each uh, step, you can register a, an assertion. And then you tell uh, the harness that the test is done so it can continue on blocking. Uh, this is an example of this test. So uh, you, you register the, uh, the load event. On, on load, and uh, that happens to assert that the event type is load. So that was simple. Uh, web IDL test is uh, um, is basically uh, web IDL is basically a format for defining interfaces. Uh, they're typically JavaScript APIs, uh, which are meant to be implemented by browser vendors. And uh, the web IDL tests are an extension which you can put on top of test harness JS. So you load in this second JavaScript, and you can do tests like these ones. Uh, you have ref tests uh, for when your test result is visual. So here we have an example of a bidirectional override. Uh, so um, yeah, you have the, the test on the, left, on the left there, and uh, the, the reference on the right uh, using simple, uh, simple HTML. So this tests if the BDO thing works. There are also a number of things which uh, um, uh, isn't possible currently to automate. Uh, and these are simply manual tests, uh, which you use when nothing else would work. Uh, a couple of examples of things that are untestable at the moment are um, is vis on visibility change. So if your browser goes into the background, uh, you have Chrome events, like if you resize the window, uh, blur on focus, and on full screen change. These are things that are hard to do with JavaScript because the JavaScript doesn't control um, the Chrome uh, of the browser. Uh, there are also a number of new web APIs, uh, such as those for the Firefox OS uh, device, um, which Mozilla is developing. Um, uh, there are telef telephony APIs, vibration, SMS, idle, screen orientation, power management, Bluetooth, uh, battery status, NFC, spell check, lots of different things. 
Uh, so all of these are things which you, on devices which support them, you can, you can implement, um, you, can, you can use from JavaScript. There are also visual CSS tests, which, uh, for example, uh, this one. Uh, if the square is still red, please indicate that the test has failed. And it used to be the case that you had a, like a, a test genre which you'd actually manually go in and click. Is the square red? No, it isn't. It's a pass. It's a very tedious process, right, if you have like tens and thousands of these tests. Um, then you have some helpers for tests. Uh, there's a requirement that you uh, are able to speak to server sometimes to test some specs. Like you have to delay uh, the connection, for example, when you have to test XML, uh, XHR WebSockets. Uh, perhaps you need redirect status codes. Perhaps you need to mani manipulate the connection data. There's a VP, uh, WPT serve uh, library, which is in WPT repo, uh, which allows you to do this. This is an example of how it works. It uh, writes a uh, status code and it actually sleeps for a second before actually sending the response. There are some uh, implementation uh, requirements uh, for this. Uh, tests must be pulled from upstream. Uh, they need to store the expected result of each test. They need to be super robust uh, against misbehaving tests. And um, um, because uh, tests are continuously upgraded, so uh, uh, yeah, so the test needs to be really, 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 really robust because they're, uh, uh, because they're uh, updated very frequent, frequently. And uh, it can't require things that only make sense in, in one vendor context, like something which is Chrome-specific or Firefox-specific. Um, automation needs to be easy for the browser vendors to use. You need, uh, we need to have cross-browser and cross-platform support. It needs to be possible to run the WPT test, of course. Uh, they need to run fast. Uh, parallel would be uh, ideal. Uh, they need to run in a normal browser, which means that they need to run in the top-level browsing context, because some tests uh, assume that, uh, meaning you can't really run them in an iframe container. Uh, we need to guard ourselves against misbehavior. If the browser hangs, uh, we need to kill it, for example. And we need some machine-readable uh, test output so that we can interface this with uh, third-party systems, which the browser vendors already have implemented, like their own testing systems. And uh, we're solving these problems uh, by, in the WPT runner uh, by pushing test scheduling into the harness. Uh, that basically uh, uh, means uh, that um, um, basically means that we have control of the, of, over the browser process. Uh, we need we have machine readable output solved through structured logging, uh, which is like a um, like a JSON-ish schema for uh, storing uh, outcomes, expected outcomes, uh, debug output, anything. Uh, and then we need a way to communicate with the browser uh, via some protocol, and that happened to be WebDriver. So WebDriver uh, happened to be at a very convenient point in time uh, uh, for solving these problems. The general design of this is that uh, we have a Python test runner which uh, schedules tests. Uh, it typically uses WebDriver to drive the browser, uh, for JavaScript tests, basically what we do is that we open a window at the start of the test run, then we call execute async script uh, from WebDriver to start the test, then we inject some JavaScript uh, that opens the, um, um, uh, the test page in a, in a new window, and then we have a callback for when uh, test results are posted back uh, via channel from uh, the open window. Ref tests are actually even simpler. They just use WebDriver's normal APIs. Uh, the, the, um, the WPT runner architecture uh, is basically a test manager instance which owns a browser and a test runner. These things are fairly obvious, so I won't go into any detail. Uh, the browser is an abstraction over different products. Uh, we have one subclass for, for each browser. Uh, the test runner owns a test executor that actually knows how to run the tests. Uh, the test executor has a subclass per test type and a method of executing the test. And, the, and this basically uh, re, uh, provides us with the two axes of extensibility that we need. Uh, I've just put this in here if you're interested, so you can look at this later. I don't expect you to see it. Um, the current status of this is that um, um, it's working on Firefox and uh, B2G, uh, Firefox OS. Uh, it's even working on Servo, which is uh, Mozilla's new attempt at uh, re-implementing a browser, a parallel browser. Uh, it's working on Chrome uh, via WebDriver, and Microsoft are actually adding support for IE. So things are looking very, very interesting. Uh, an interesting uh, thing I should mention is, of course, that um, 
um, the WPT repo, uh, the WPT tests have this concept of a manifest files which lists all your, all of your tests. But it also has a concept of expected test results. And this is because uh, the browser vendors, uh, different CI systems, have, uh, have uh, they work slightly differently. For example, Mozilla's and Google's work in a way that uh, they expect all the tests to pass the whole time. Whereas Opera's, for example, will um, uh, not expect tests to pass the, the entire time. So uh, we need to cater for, for those different um, uh, use cases. Uh, but essentially, that's sort of, that sort of um, uh, defining whether a test is expected or not to, to pass. Uh, it's actually extremely useful in the context of uh, testing the web platform because it allows you to have things uh, to have tests for things which are not already implemented and uh, that way you can actually track your progress of something you implement um, is this test driven development nah, not sure but uh, the reality is that um, uh, the test suites are actually never complete uh, they're never feature complete uh, they're almost always uh, they always almost always have bugs and I can mo uh, and they most certainly don't match reality um, yes. <laughs> so, are we, uh, um, so do we have interoperability yet? The answer is sort of. Uh, things are pretty interoperable. But uh, the honest answer is that, is that we really don't know until we start collecting test results. Uh, but the exciting thing is that um, a web driver is being used in a very untraditional uh, testing context. And it's filling an important role. It's really helping us to uh, test the web forward in, in the truest sense uh, in an automated way. So, uh, we've solved a simple problem. Uh, we've, um, uh, we can fi uh, we've, we've uh, found a way to automate all our, all our existing set of, sets of tests, but how do we actually increase uh, our, um, our test coverage? Uh, what about the tests, for example, that can't be automated? And to answer this question, why can't tests be automated, we, we, we need to ask, well, why can't they be? Uh, we need, I mean, one, one reason is that to test some of these things, we need to convince the browser vendors that uh, we should take control over their, o over their computers, that we should disregard all security measures in the browser, and uh, that we should have access uh, to all hidden things inside of uh, the browser. And that's quite controversial. Uh, what we really need is something which can emulate a user. We need something which is, uh, which is capable of controlling uh, the browser instance from, uh, from an out-of-process program. Uh, we need something which would let us instrument the browser. And um, we really do have that, don't, don't we? We have WebDriver. And we're already using it in WPT Run. We already have a WebDriver instance controlling uh, the browser. Uh, so let's have a look at one of the unautomatable test cases. Uh, for example, if you have, have on-key-down, on-key-press, on-key-up events attached to your document, uh, uh, tests will, if uh, those are examples of things which can't be tested currently, because, uh, you, I mean, you can generate a fake synthetic JavaScript uh, event, but that doesn't really, uh, mean, uh, that doesn't really mean the same thing as injecting into so something into the event queue of the browser or into the operating system. Uh, we have... Uh, Tests, uh, um, yes, so let's have a, actually a look at this test. Um, uh, let me see if I can find it. There we go. So this is uh, the test. Uh, actually, I have the source code in, uh, in my slide. There we go. So uh, it's an async test. Uh, you load the browser, uh, but there's no way of simulating uh, the, um, the uh, key event. Uh, so the test doesn't really pass until you press a button on your keyboard. And uh, the interesting thing, I found this is, a, this is an actual test from the WPT repo, which I found. And uh, you'll note the, the, the first comment up there, uh, that someone is thinking ahead. Uh, I, I haven't seen this before. Uh, so if we try to run this test, for example, uh, it's now running. And I need to press a key. And there it completes all the tests pass. If I just leave it running, it's going to eventually time out. But this is a great example of a test which currently isn't automatable. So let's have a stab at, um, stab at uh, implementing this test. This is uh, fairly standard Python. 
um, we load in a bunch of, um, uh, for those who don't know Python, I'm going to just walk you through it. Uh, we uh, load in a bunch of uh, requirements, a bunch of dependencies. Uh, we need a way to define which, like this is how I'd implement it. We need to define which browser to test with. Uh, we need to get the capabilities of that browser. Then we connect to our remote uh, web driver server and we request a browser with those capabilities. We load in uh, our test case and we send a key. So far, so good. Then of course, because um, JavaScript is asynchronous, we need to wait for the test results to come back. So we bring in a uh, web driver wait and uh, we assert or we wait for the presence of the element uh, by ID summary. And then we get the test result uh, from, that, uh, from that element. And then we print that to standard out and we exit. But this thing is very verbose, isn't it? I mean, if a tester had to go through these, these, uh, uh, this sort of uh, approach every time he wrote a web driver test, he would become very sad because there's lots of boilerplate here. Uh, granted, some of the things we can remove, you can put into a library which we load in, but in, in the end, uh, you're going to end up with something roughly like this. Uh, and this is, by the way, a simplified, uh, simplified test because you, you, also have, you also need to register the test events with a, with a, with a logger which uh, reports it back in some machine readable format. So um, it's not easy. But the problem with people is that people don't always want to learn new tools. They don't want to learn a new framework. And especially, they don't want to learn a new language. And this is all fine, I think. Because when we had this discussion uh, with the what we G, uh, this, is a, uh, this previous example is, is something similar to what the WebDriver Working Group uh, ended up with proposing. And uh, we went to the, w, uh, in, to the what we G, and they said, I don't really want to use this. Uh, I don't want to learn a new language. They were very skeptical. And I can understand them, because they already have perfect tools um, um, for, what, uh, for what their purpose was. They wanted something which was, which was much, much simpler. So, um, um, now our, uh, let's see. So if we take a step back, I thought long and hard about this for a few weeks, and I eventually came up with um, a solution. I should highlight that this is not the WebDriver Working Group official position. Uh, it's a proposal of my own. Uh, I haven't submitted it yet, uh, but this is a taste or a preview of what um, automating a web platforms test with WebDriver might look like in the future. Um, so we have a remote WebDriver. And the remote WebDriver is, in all its simplicity, an HTTP server, right? It accepts some HTTP calls. You can send it some JSON uh, as, 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 as the argument. Um, um, we use HTTP uh, because that's the simplest pro uh, protocol which you can implement in literally any language. And we already have a web driver session. I, I mentioned this earlier. So uh, the WPT runner al already has a, a web driver session for maintaining control over the browser process. So the use case for web driver is often in combination with assertions that can be made using testharness.js. Like they want to do this, uh, this key event thing. They have all of their tests, but what they really need in addition is something which goes, press a button. What if, conceptually, we had an interface from the JS test to web driver controlling the browser session? So, uh, what I'm going to show you is an in-document JavaScript, um, a script, uh, an in-document in JavaScript script controlling its own browser session from an out-of-process driver through the WebDriver remote server. And uh, I've included a couple of examples of what it might look like. Um, I can actually show you how it works, but uh, I mean, uh, running tests uh, uh, in an automated way, it's usually very boring because they just disappear right away. So I've included some screenshots of how it, uh, how it, uh, how it looks. So this is um, uh, a JavaScript running in Chrome, controlling Chrome itself. This is kind of like Inception, right? So uh, in, in this case, uh, the third test, the, the two first ones, which were just to make sure uh, the, things, the, the thing actually worked. But the third test here, it says get title matches document title. And uh, I've included the, uh, the JavaScript console at the bottom here. And uh, 
if you have really good sight, you can see that it uh, records the JSON payload, which is sent to and from uh, the WebDriver server. This is pretty amazing, right? I have another example uh, in um, Firefox, which is a little, which is a little bit more um, uh, elaborate. So I've, this isn't uh, like an official test or anything. I've just thrown together some, some, some functions just to make sure that it works. Uh, and uh, there's one failing test, but that's because of a bug that I know about. So you can basically, in this way, control the browser from JavaScript inside the browser it's controlling. It's, it's amazing, I think. Uh, this is an example just to show you I'm not cheating. Uh, this is the uh, inspector in, in um, Firefox. You can, also, uh, you can see all of the payloads being sent backwards and forwards uh, between uh, the, uh, uh, the Selenium server in this case. You can drive it uh, directly against the Chrome driver if you want to. You should be able to drive it directly against the new Firefox driver, which is based on Marionette, once we have a, an HTTP server in place. And uh, you can drive it against Selenium. So that opens up a lot of opportunities. So uh, to um, wrap up, um, it is a brave new world out there. And uh, the web driver specification is opening up completely new uh, areas which have previously been untestable uh, for web standards. Uh, I encourage you all to take a look at the test, at test the Web Forward project. It's a really interesting project. It um, requires help. Uh, the, consist, uh, the coverage in the web platform tests is not great. Uh, and so you can all help. So thank you. I'd be happy to take questions. Uh, otherwise, you can just uh, find me uh, afterwards if you have comments. Uh, so the question is, uh, um, uh, the question was whether, uh, how much money the, the big companies uh, contribute to the WVC, if I understand. Uh, oh, of the tests themselves. Yeah, so they currently don't really contribute that much. Um, there are individuals working at the browser vendors who do this partly in their own time. Uh, but the focus amongst the biggest browser vendors isn't great on the platform. So uh, um, you could say, that, like, there are lots of companies contributing, but the focus isn't great. We, uh, th th this is why we need individuals uh, and individual contributors. That's great. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much for, for coming.